Okay, so let's uh, start the fifth week of our little small group Bible study that we've been uh, talking about the end times. And now here we are. And we were supposed to, uh, this week we were supposed to do both beasts. Uh, uh, there are two beasts described in um, chapter 13 of Revelation. Uh, one comes out of the sea and one comes out of the land. And we only got to the one that uh, came out of the uh, sea. We didn't get to the one that came out of the land. And we're going to get to that next week. Um, possibly tying it in with uh, the um, Antichrist, the man, who we, were, who was scheduled to, we were scheduled to talk about that one next week. So maybe we'll do both of them. I don't know. Whatever we have time for. Uh, in our first week, um, if you haven't, if you if you just tuning in now, our first week we um, uh, studied the 70 weeks of Daniel, uh, and it has a very powerful uh, proof that Jesus fulfilled the 70 week prophecy when Messiah would come. So it's uh, really, I highly suggest. You, you uh, go to the, you, you um, hear that first week uh, recording um, because you know it's almost crystal clear that Jesus fulfills that prophecy as he should. If he is the Messiah. He should fulfill the prophecy where it says that he's coming. Okay. In the second week, we debated the um, pre-trib point and the post-trib point because Christians are divided on this issue, and uh, if you know, there's we shouldn't be. I mean, if one of them is right; they both can't be right. Uh, and we had the debate: which one do Christians go through the tribulation or not? So, it's also highly good that you, if, you know, you listen to that. Um, no matter what your convictions are now, it's good to hear some of the things that are said there. And then the um, third week, we went over a uh, timeline, the timeline of the final week. And we pointed out that not Daniel, in Daniel 9.27, when he talks about um, a covenant that is made with many for one week, and that is typically taken as the final week, we talk about that and how it somewhat is the final week and somewhat isn't the final week, and that part of that, part of that verse is already fulfilled, at least, you know, the way I see it, that the covenant uh, is already established. And go, you know, tune in on it, get that video, and watch that one. And then in the fourth week, we um, talked about the uh, Revelation 12. We had the uh, Wonder Woman in heaven. We had the uh, Red Dragon that had seven heads and ten horns. And we talked about who the woman was and who the dragon was and we get into the details about the what the seven heads represent and what the ten horns represent so if you're unclear on that get that one but this week we're going to talk about the beast that rises out of the sea in Revelation 13 now, um, it was divided, uh, you know, the, we already had the study. Uh, I have to make a confession, I forgot to bring, I, bring, I brought a lot of the recording equipment, but I forgot one piece, and that one piece um, prevented us from getting this recording. Uh, we, did, we did make a try of it, but I'm not sure how that turned out, so maybe I'll have an, uh, pieces of it that work, but right now, um, this is after the study already happened, and I'm here alone by myself, and I'm, I'm just going over it with you uh, while it's sort of fresh in my mind. 
okay? Okay, let's get started. We'll read the um, chapter uh, about the first beast, um, and then we'll talk about it. Revelation 13, 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And, and the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and his great authority. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Verse 8, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. If any, in verse 9, If any man have an ear, let him hear. Verse 10, He that leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He that kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Okay, so <clears throat> getting back to um, the first verse, the prophet John is uh, talking and he says, uh, I stood upon the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. Now the word beast comes from the Greek word zoe, uh, which has to do with the fact that he's a living creature. Okay, so beast was the king is the King James word that they gave the English word that they gave that, and uh, I think it's fitting. Uh, the beast is is kind of fitting anyway. So. Let's leave it as, let's, let's call him the beast. Um, he comes out of the sea, and we're going to get to that a little later. Um, he has seven heads and ten horns, exactly like the red dragon. The red dragon has seven heads and ten horns. Um, uh, except this guy, he's described as... Uh, Upon his heads, he has the names of blasphemy. And this guy is not red. He was like unto a leopard. A leopard is not red. He has spots. And his feet as a bear, and his mouth as a lion. Okay, so what is that all telling us? Well, we just did that study on the dragon last week. And we noticed that the dragon had these seven heads, and we compared them to the beast that, uh, of Daniel chapter 7, where he sees these beasts in his, in his vision. And uh, one was like a lion, one was like a bear, one was like a leopard, and one was, had ten horns. So we see that um, this beast has characteristics of the heads of the dragon. So it's sort of like he's in the image of the father, you might say. He's the son, and he's in the image of the father. 
So we get that in the second part of uh, verse 2, uh, where it says that uh, the dragon gave him the power, gave him his power and his seat and his great authority. Doesn't that sound like the father saying, come on and join the company? Okay, let, let's just take a look also about what exactly this great authority he had, the, the devil, the Satan, the dragon has to give the beast. That's in um, um, Matthew 4, verse 8 through 11. Let me just read that to you. And the devil takes him to up into an exceeding... Now this is... Um, Jesus ha is uh, being tempted by the devil at this point. He just uh, fasted for 40 days. And, um, and that's where we are right now as far as this goes. Verse 8. Again the devil <coughs> takes him to the exceeding high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and says unto him all these things I will give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me then says Jesus unto him get thee hence Satan for it is written thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and serve him only and him only shalt thou serve then the devil leaves him, and behold, the angels came to and ministered unto him. But you see there that the, um, the devil or the serpent or the dragon has, has um, all the kingdoms of the world and the glories of him. And he's offering this to Jesus. So the, this is what is... Um, owned you might say all the kingdom of the world you might say and the glory of the kingdoms are owned by serpent and the devil and another thing we pointed out uh, uh, you know is that uh, this was not a piece of cake for Jesus to sustain no because he was a man in the f he was God but he was God in the flesh he did come from the seed of Mary, of a woman. Okay? So this was a temptation. This was something that um, he overcame. And because he is God, he overcame it. Because he did have the uh, knowledge of who he was and where he was going, and he knew his father, he was able to overcome these temptations. That's exactly how we overcome our temptations. We overcome it through the knowledge of who we are, who God is, and what God has, is requesting of us. Okay, so uh, it seems like we have a father, the, the, the dragon with the seven heads, ten horns, and we have the son, this beast, that uh, also has seven heads and ten horns. The father, the dragon, gives the, the son, the beast, his power and his great authority. All the kingdoms of the world are, are offered to him. And um, so we have this father, son, and, and uh, we're looking ahead into uh, Revelation 19.20. We see that the other beast in chapter 13 seems to be um, the false prophet. So it's sounding familiar and... Um, it's it kind of easy to see that it's a, a, an unholy trinity, you might say, with, with the dragon, the beast, and the, the false prophet beast. And uh, to add, even, add it even further, there's a harlot that sits in uh, Revelation, and there's in Revelation chapter 12, there's this righteous woman who represents the church, Israel and the church, the righteous seed. And... Um, so, you know, it's, it's like the good team and the bad team, and we have to make up our minds here on earth who, which team we want to join. Very important. The value of decision, very important. Join the right team. Okay. Um, 
exactly who this be who is this beast that we're talking about let's start getting you know bring it out let's bring it out into the open as who I think this beast is but before I do let's go to verse 7 um, to explain it a little bit the last part of that verse and power was given him unto all kindreds and tongues and nations so he has this beast is has power over all all kindreds and tongues and nations. Basically, he rules the entire world. Now, if you look out there and what political government, entity, empire, call it what you will, what has power over all of it? The whole world. And the United Nations comes to mind uh, because um, that one would fit. I mean, if, if it was more sovereign than it is today, then that one would definitely fit. And it is, it is, I do see it where it is becoming more and more sovereign. Okay, so it fits some of this description. Now, how about the description that uh, this beast has seven heads and ten horns? I mean, how does the United Nations fit that one? And um, I ask, what is the organization of the, I mean, how does the United Nations organized? It has um, a general assembly, all the nations uh, play a role, and it has the Security Council, which is the ruling uh, body of the, of the uh, beast, and it has the um, Secretary General, which is the spokesman of the United Nations. Okay, so so how does that? I mean, how how do we get to the seven heads and ten horns? Well, um, right now the Security Council is composed of five permanent head permanent uh, members and ten non-permanent members. Okay, so that would be five heads and ten horns. So all we would need is two more heads and it would have seven heads and ten horns. And I think that it is going to be getting its two more heads and I think that it'll have a total of seven permanent members right before it begins its 42 month rule. So that'll be a sign to us, uh, you know, when we see that the Security Council has two more members and now it has seven heads and ten horns, it'll be like, you know, an alarm going off saying, hey, the seals are about to be opened, the uh, 42 months is about to begin, the um, tribute, the uh, Great Tribulation will happen, you know, in the next three and a half years from now. So, I mean, it's like we're given these, uh, the prophecy, we're given the prophecy, we should study the prophecy, and we should look for signs, and we're given the signs. So, this is given to us. Again, when we see that it has seven in the Security Council, that's a big sign for us. Now, what are those... Um, what, what do we think those next two members will be? What do I think? I think that the, uh, you have, Ronald, I know Ronald Reagan, uh, I read an article back in the early 90s that he, um, would, he suggested that Germany and Japan become m permanent members. So those are the two that I expect to come in, Germany and Japan. And that is, more, that is fitting. Why is it fitting? Um, well, verse 3 says, And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. So one of those two countries I just mentioned was Germany. And looking back, World War II, not too long ago, 
uh, this Germany was devastated. 1945, Berlin, look at the films. It's, it's devastated. It's wounded, wounded by a sword. Verse 14, uh, it's wounded by a sword. So a sword is, um, represents war. So um, it's fitting. I mean, um, if we take Germany to be the head that is wounded by the sword uh, and does live, I mean, it was devastated in 1945. You look at the pictures of Berlin, it's, it's wiped out uh, by the war. And um, it is rebuilt, and looking at it today, it's uh, a thriving uh, empire. It's, it's uh, the main thrust of the, the, the European Union. And so uh, if Germany uh, and Japan uh, become permanent members, we, we definitely have a fit um, of seven head, ten horned beast, and one of the heads is wounded by a sword and does live. Okay, so uh, moving along, uh, let's take another description. Let's look at another description of this uh, beast. Um, verse 1, for example, latter part of verse 1. Uh, and upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. So before we talk about that, let's focus in on one of the forms of, of blasphemy as indicated in um, John 10, verse 33. The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because thou, being a man, makest thou self equal with God, makest thou self God. So that's a form of blasphemy. And we're going to look at these heads, we're going to look at the names of the, of the seven heads of the Security Council, uh, and, you know, we'll study it, okay? Okay, so um, let's take a look at one of the heads, one of the seven heads, China, for example, okay? Now let's look at the name China and look at the name as what the Chinese themselves call themselves. They call themselves Chang Yua. Chang Yua. And it means middle country or center of the land. Okay? Um, that it is the middle of the world. It is the they are the VIP of the nations. Keeping that in mind, let's take a look at Zechariah 2, verse 10 and 11. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I am come, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord. And many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and shall be my people, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto thee. So we have the picture of uh, God dwelling amongst his people. And wherever God sits, it, to us it is the Holy of Holies. Um, and we have the picture of the other nations surrounding this um, center, Holy of Holies. So the center of the land is God himself in the Holy of Holies and all the nations surround it. That's the picture we get from this Zechariah. And here comes China saying, I'm the center of the world. Now, if that would be blasphemy if China was serious in declaring itself to be the center and not where God and his people and where God sits okay so that's where we get the blasphemy tint in, in China's name okay let's go to uh, a possible um, nation of the United Nations Japan uh, 
it, it's his name really means literally means sun origin and uh, they also uh, think of themselves as the land of the rising sun so what can we compare that to let's uh, take a look at John 8 verse 12 then spake Jesus again unto them saying I am the light of the world he that follows me shall not walk in darkness but shall have the light of life so we have this um, competing uh, forces Jesus competing against Japan as being the light of the world so which one is it going to be so by Japan saying I'm the light of the world in a, again that's that tint of blasphemy that comes in there okay let's go to Russia now since I couldn't really find a direct um, translation of the name Rush uh, you know I, I went to the Bible and I looked at um, uh, Ezekiel chapter 38 um, verse 3 for example and say thus saith the Lord God behold I am against thee O Gog the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal now um, some translate that some translate um, translated to be Rosh Meshach and Tubal and most likely ancient names of Russia, Moscow, and Tubalsk, which uh, to me, uh, I, I got a feeling that uh, that the way, the way of looking at that is correct, that Rosh in that the Hebrew word there for, for chief, the Hebrew word Rosh means chief, and it's translated as chief. But in the Septuagint, for example, they, tr they left Rosh in there as if it were a place. And it is being kind of redundant to say chief priest, chief prince. That's sort of redundant. And so um, I, I kind of like go along with it that um, Rosh uh, in that verse stands for Russia and Rosh in Hebrew does mean chief or head okay so he's the the Russia's a head chief let's uh, compare what uh, scripture talks about uh, Christ being the head verse um, Ephesians 1 uh, 19 starting with 19 and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places he set him far above all principalities and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but also in the which, which is that which is to come and has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So you see there, um, he's far above all principality and power, and every name that is named, including Russia's name, who Russia calls himself the head. And um, he has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church so you see that um, if Russia were very serious about being the head and confronts the head who was the head of the church with that that would be that blasphemous uh, characteristic of, of the name Russia okay so let's go on to the next one um, the United Kingdom it's represented by four countries, England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. And um, to make the comparison uh, to the scripture like we've been doing here, 
Let's first go to uh, Matthew uh, 28, uh, verse 19, when Jesus says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy, Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. So uh, I'm just pointing out the, the Trinity right there. Um, and so we have the Father who is represented, you know, who is King of the Universe. He's often called King of the Universe. And the Son, who was uh, called uh, in a couple of places as King of Kings, okay? So they're kings. I'm getting at to the point that they're kings. Holy Spirit is really uh, not mentioned as a king, but to me he's a king. He's a king in his own right, and um, his role as pointing to the king of kings, and that's the reason why he doesn't take on that role. But he is a king, most certainly. So we have three kings, and um, let's go also to verse John 10 verse 30 it's very simple very short one it says I and my father are one okay so they're both kings the father and the son are both kings and they're united kings and the Holy Spirit of course is united with them as well so we have the united kings united kingdoms the kingdom of our God has become the kingdom of our Christ. The, the united kingdoms. Okay? So now, here's this great, here's this great Britain in Northern Ireland, and, you know, they're coming up and saying, you know, we're the united kingdom. Now, if they, again, if they were serious about that, and they came, and they came up to, God, uh, to God's face, and they declared that, then that would be the blasphemy you know, of the name. That's what I'm saying. Okay, let's go to the next country, uh, France. I looked up the meaning of France, and uh, I came to the conclusion that it was uh, it meant free, F R E E, or freedom, or liberty. And for the scripture comparison for that one, let's go to uh, John eight thirty one and thirty two. Then said Jesus unto the Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Okay? Um, and we are all familiar with the uh, title where Jesus called himself the way, the truth, and the life. So, uh, verse 36 there in John, um, if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. So, he's talking about a freedom that cannot be compared with any other freedom that men know of. Free of sin, free, uh, free of bondage, free to worship God in spirit and in truth, free of condemnation, okay? Not being condemned anymore. That's the freedom he's talking about. Can France offer this freedom? Can France, is France the truth? The truth sets you free? Can France ever be the truth? I mean, this, by calling itself free, if, again, if France is serious about it being the freedom, the freedom, then that, again, that's blasphemy. Okay, let's go to the next one, uh, Germany, as um, what we're saying is a 2B country in the seven heads. And I looked up what Germany uh, means, and it basically just means, or Deutschland, uh, it basically just means um, the tribe land. Uh, which uh, I I really don't really see a, a a blasphemy connection with that. But again, this is the head that had the deadly wound and was healed. Now, the the name, the propaganda name that 
Nazi Germany gave itself was the fatherland. Okay? Now, the fatherland, let's compare that with what scripture has to say. Uh, Matthew 23, verse 9. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. So now Germany is saying, we're the fatherland, again, a blasphemous name. Okay, let's go to the seventh one on the list, which is um, our own country here, United States of America. Now, it's taught in the schools that America was named after the map maker, Amerigo Vespucci, the Italian map maker. Um, now, Amerigo is Italian, and what does that mean in English? Well, the English name uh, is Henry. Now, what does Henry come from? The origin of Henry is German, and in, in their language it means I'm Heimrich, Heimrich, or home ruler. Okay? So, let's go to the uh, comparison. Let's go to the scripture comparison of Ephesians 5, 22. We'll start with 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and he gave himself for it. Okay, um, in verse going down to chapter 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for, he, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment of promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live, it, thou, thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, uh, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in nurture and admonition of the Lord. So, uh, we're basically told there of the uh, hierarchy of the home. We have the um, uh, man who is supposed to love the wife and nurture his children. We have the, the wife who's supposed to also bear the children and bring them up in the Lord. And we have the children to obey the parents. And we have Christ over the man and over the woman and over the whole family. So we have the home ruler is Christ, as it should be. So America is coming around and saying, we're the home ruler. We're the ruler of the home. And uh, again, that fits into that blasphemous category if they're going to be serious about that and exalt themselves in front of God and, and, and um, you know, overrule his rules, his domestic rules and stuff like that. So there we have it. Um, all seven heads uh, can be can be, it can be said of all seven heads that their names are blasphemous names if, again, if you take them seriously. And these, believe me, these people do take themselves seriously in their quest for power. And, it is, and, and Antichrist is serious about uh, him being God and no other God before him. All right, so uh, let's continue on looking at uh, some of the descriptions of this guy. This beast, this entity, this corporation, this this um, conglomerate, and there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemy. A mouth. He has a mouth. A security council. Uh, we have the general assembly, and we have the secretary general. There's a man, a secretary general, that speaks for the entity. And this Secretary General, the man, when 
uh, it's in this 42 months rule when, uh, you know, and it's in its prime. Um, I believe that this is going to be the Antichrist, the man, okay? And he's going to be blasphemous. He's going to declare himself to be God, and he's going to be declaring him his, his um, United Nations blasphemous as well. Okay, verse 6 again. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, that's us, and them that dwell in heaven. That's the angels and the righteous. So it's uh, nice, one nice thing, it's, uh, he's only got 42 months of this uh, overcoming the saints uh, and blaspheming us, blaspheming God. And, but then he uh, blasphemes and causes the abomination of desolation and then his predecessor, his nemesis, the, uh, the other beast takes over for the remaining time, times and dividing of times. And, um, you know, it's, it, it, life for us is not that nice, but uh, the, the seventh trumpet is blown and, and um, our Lord does come back. Okay, let's go back to verse 4. Uh, and they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So, uh, you know, you have all... Basically, we're going to be predicting... I'm predicting that the nations give up their sovereignty. Uh, they give up their... Um, military army, you might say, over to the United Nations. And uh, what's left to uh, uh, is the regional pol police uh, to make sure that law and order, according to United Nations, now it's United Nations international law and order, so the, the police are now going to serve um, this new law and uh, this, uh, it's basically going to be a uh, dictator type, type setup. So, uh, you know, it's, like I said, it's, it's, only for 40, it's only for seven years. We can, we can endure it. You know, he that endures unto the end shall be saved. So, uh, and lo, I am with you always even to the end of the earth. But uh, what I'm getting at is, um, if you know, they have all the guns and they have the great army and uh, like it says in verse four, um, who is able to make war with the beast? He's got all the guns, he's gonna compensate the guns. I mean, there's, he's the winner, he's the winner. It's declared, he's the winner. But, uh, you know, we read the back of the book and, you know, he's really not the winner. He's only the winner for this uh, period of time that God allows him to be the winner. And um, I'm talking about empires in chapter 7 of Daniel, uh, verse 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him his him dominion and glory and a kingdom and all the people all people nations and languages sound familiar should serve him his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom is that which shall not be destroyed so there's the difference uh, Antichrist is going to have a kingdom uh, where all kingdoms, kindreds and nations and tongues shall worship him. And, uh, and, but Jesus is going to have an everlasting dominion, everlasting. It, it, it's not going to be a temporary thing. 
And um, also, uh, as far as antichrists, um, what people worshiping the, the dragon and worshiping the beast, that's not entirely true. Because uh, let's go over to verse 8, for example, 13, Rev. 13, verse 8. And all, thou, all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So uh, there are those not worshiping him, and those are those that are found in the book of life. And may your name be written in the book of life. I mean, why not? He's got the book of life, and he writes names in the book of life. Why not your name? And all you, you know, and whosoever believes in him, to them he gave everlasting life. So, you know, it's there for you. It's there for me. We should take it. Okay, I promised that we were going to get to uh, why I think um, this part about verse 1, the fact that he's a beast that comes ri rising out of the sea. And how do I get to that? Well, um, let's first look at uh, Daniel 11, uh, 45. And he, uh, talking about the Antichrist, uh, description of him, shall plant the tabernacle of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him so you notice where uh, the United Nations building is located it's located in Manhattan in the North America which is sort of like an empire or a mountain between the seas. It has got the Atlantic on one side, it's got the Pacific on the other side. It's definitely an empire um, between the seas. It's planted in New York. New York is called the Empire State. and. Um, and notice it says, in the glorious holy mountain. Now, now um, holy simply means separate. Mountain, again, uh, is a term used for empire. Uh, glorious, uh, you know, you can throw that in if you want. But, um, so that, that fits there. You know, John's over in Patmos, in, in uh, Isle, right off the Greek uh, island there. And uh, he's looking out into this, you know, he's on the sand of the sea, he's looking, and he sees this beast come out, you know, out of the sea. So uh, that, that makes sense. Okay, so uh, it looks like the United Nations fits the bill. Yay, yay, why yay? Uh, again, uh, I, I don't want to add to the book. Um, uh, I, I, you know, I think that the United Nations is going to fit this. Um, I would be very surprised if it didn't. I would be very surprised. First of all, we have to have the Germany and Japan come in. We have to have um, the nations of the world give their sovereignty up to the United Nations. Um, the United Nations has to have control of the uh, army, the one army of the world. Um, so you have a lot of things going on. It's going to the United Nations has to be, uh, or at least the spokesman for the United Nations has to be the one to confirm the covenant, as we talked about last time. You know, what we talked about when we were talking about the timeline. Uh, the United Nations has to come along and uh, uh, do that and he has to have his seven heads when it happens. Again, I would be very surprised if, if it doesn't come out, you know, if somehow the United Nations just um, diminishes and there's some other beast that comes up. I, I would be very, very surprised. But anyway, that's the way it's going. 
Also, if we recall, uh, when we were talking about the uh, covenant with made with many, Daniel 9, 27, um, that it was, we think it's the Oslo Accord. Um, that Oslo Accord, I, I, I forgot to mention, was based on uh, Security Council, uh, United Nations Security Council resolutions 242 and 338. I mean, without getting into the detail of what that is, um, it doesn't matter. It's based on uh, a UN resolution. Okay, so um, they are definitely into the play of these things. And um, also, we were talking about um, where the, the Antichrist would set up as, uh, as his temple. And uh, something new came up in when I was ba uh, doing some background research on... Uh, the topic uh, for this for tonight, and um, we have the uh, we were talking about the uh, where the the uh, antichrist would uh, declare himself as God. It's 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 written that um, he will sit in the temple as God. Uh, the Thessalonians and um, Jesus called, uh, said that uh, when he stands in the holy place, it would uh, trigger the abomination of desolation. And we were, you know, discussing, uh, does the temple have to be rebuilt? Um, uh, or doesn't it have to be rebuilt? And, you know, uh, I've made a point that um, this temple could be his temple. And as I was doing research on the uh, UN, uh, I noticed that uh, it has within it a part of it, it's a non-government organization within the UN, it's got a temple of understanding. It's got its own temple. So uh, isn't that interesting? It is a global interfaith organization uh, at the United Nations. It's a non-governmental organization in consultative status with the United Nations Economic and Social Council, UNESC. UNESC. And its mission is to promote understanding among the world's religions, to recognize the oneness of the human family, and to achieve a spiritual United Nations. It has gained support of religious leaders, including Pope John XXIII, 23rd, and the Dalai Lama and other prominent re representatives of Buddhist, Christian, Hindu, Jewish, Muslim, and other faiths. Okay, um, also um, there's a quote uh, by Mikhail Gorbachev back uh, from the Los Angeles Times back in uh, May of 1997. He said, uh, do, do not do unto the environment of others what you do not want done unto your own environment. Dot, dot, dot. My hope is that this charter will be a kind of Ten Commandments, a Sermon on the Mount that provides a guide for human behavior towards the environment of the next century. Now, the charter that he was talking about came out of the uh, Earth Summit uh, that was held in Rio de, de Janeiro. Uh, I think it was in 92 they had that. Um, but... Um, anyway, the, they took this, uh, first of all, he's, he's talking like, like uh, a sermon on, it's like a sermon on the mount, okay? Do not do unto the environment of others what you do not want to do unto. So he's going to take that uh, Ten Commandments, as he called it, this charter, and it's going to be placed inside a box called the Ark of Ho Hope. The Earth Charter is handwritten on papyrus paper and it's ready for presentation to the United Nations. The Ark, along with its Gaia Ten Commandments. So you see, uh, God has his laws and uh, he, keeps, he considers them to be sacred. They're put into a box called the Ark of the Covenant and um, they're placed in the temple, the Holy of Holies, and uh, here along comes this this uh, 
this guy that says, uh, I want the Ten Commandments of the Earth, of the Earth Charter, and I want to put it inside an Ark of Hope, and I want it to be an environmental thing where we preserve the Earth, and these are the laws, and everybody's got to obey them. It sounds, you know, it sounds very, very familiar. Now, furthermore, there's um, in the United Nations, there's a, a room, it's called the uh, meditation room. And you can go there, and um, it has a, if you go in there, there's a black stone, and uh, Dag Hammarskjöld, who set the room up, was uh, called, the, said that the block is every man's God. Uh, I, I don't think he's every man's God. Do you? Is he your God? Nah, that's, that's not your God, right? Okay. The room is 18 feet wide, which is a 366 thing. Uh, six plus six plus six. And uh, it's, it's got the shape of a truncated pyramid, um, which again is um, symbolism in the Freemason and uh, that type of thing, that secret society type of stuff. So we have this uh, summing in this whole thing up. We have this um, great empire coming into vision closer and closer. And we can see him clearer and clearer. And it's frightening. Uh, frightening is a good word. But should we be, fr should we be frightened? Um, well, well, you say, look at this, uh, nobody likes this. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. First of all, we, he's going to make war with us. And he's going to overcome us. So isn't that a frightening thing? Shouldn't we be afraid of that? No, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. You have a God who created the whole universe, and he's on your side. You have to be like a David in this thing and realize who this uncircumcised Philistine is and who God is and who you are in his kingdom. And if you get a good grip on that, you'll be fine. A couple of things to tell you. Um, advice, Ex Ecclesiastes 10.4, Solomon said, if the spirit of the ruler rise up against thee, leave not thy place, for yielding pacifies great offenses. So you don't have to uh, go any place, you don't have to do anything, you don't have to uh, become political uh, motivated and you don't have to try to vote against this thing. I say, let it happen. I say, I'm glad because uh, Antichrist has to come before our Christ, before the true Christ. So let it happen. Don't leave your place. God knows about it. Uh, what's the worst that could happen? You die? If you die, what's, what's the verse? Absent in body and present with the Lord. So if you endure unto the end, you are with the Lord. If you die in the Lord before that time, if the Antichrist kills you, 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 you're with the Lord. So either way, you're with the Lord. But you can't lose your faith. You can't worship the image. You can't take the mark. Okay? Let's get a good grip on that. Let's prepare up. Be prepared as good soldiers. Let's, let's put on the armor of Christ. And, and we're in war. It says we're going to be in a war against uh, a principality and a power. 
And, and let's take uh, Jesus' advice, Luke 21, 28. And when these things begin to pass, then look up, lift up your heads, for your redemption draws nigh. Okay? So we should be glad. I mean, it doesn't look very nice, doesn't sound very nice. Um, tribulation and, and war against the saints and uh, causing you take the mark and concentration camps and things going on and all these things going on here and it's a horror it's a horror it's a horror if you don't know Jesus okay that's the horror so get with the program good night and um, next week we're going to be uh, uh, studying the um, other beast that's in chapter 13 the uh, the one with the two horns as a lamb and speaks as a dragon and we know him as the false prophet okay let's let's uh, see you next time